the deep sea diver works under two kinds of pressure. As soon as he enters the water, he is subject to water pressure. And the deeper he goes, the greater the pressure becomes and the more difficult his task. The other kind of pressure is this. The diver's work represents not only his own skill in doing a specific job in furtherance of Navy operations, but also the efforts of an entire crew of specialists in the diving trade. The diver's single pair of hands are, in effect, the hands of all these. A diving officer or diver in charge who supervises the entire diving operation. A diving tender who works at the rail. His job is to tend the diver, keeping slack out of the lines and signaling the diver by a code of pulls on the lines. A backup tender who keeps the diver's lifeline and air hose coiled to prevent tangling and who sends tools and supplies down to the diver. A phone talker in charge of communications maintains continual surveillance on the diver's Red progress diver and especially important me? on the diver's well-being. A timekeeper who is normally the diving supervisor. An engineer in charge of operating and maintaining the compressors that force air to the diver working on the bottom. A standby diver fully dressed except for his helmet is ready to assist or rescue the diver in case of trouble. The members of the crew who perform the normal operating and maintenance jobs of any naval vessel. And finally, the working diver himself, whose performance underwater is the end result of the efforts made by all. Because of this responsibility, and more importantly, because his safety is concerned, the deep sea diver must conscientiously follow certain basic procedures. In this film, we shall take up those procedures in this order. Descending to the bottom, working on the bottom, and ascending to the surface. First, the diver's procedures as he descends to the bottom. In preparation for the job, the diver is fully dressed while seated on deck. The helmet must be completely buttoned up and the diver on compressed air before the diver gets to his feet. Two taps on the helmet means stand up. Although the diver can walk unassisted, both tenders should stay close in front of him as he goes to the stage. They tend his lines and are ready to support him if he trips or stumbles under the 190 pound weight of the diving outfit. Note that while the diver's on the surface, he keeps his spitcock open to keep the air in his dress to a minimum. This will allow him more freedom of movement. Even though he's fully dressed and on compressed air, a fall to the bottom could cause serious injury. The stage is stopped as soon as he has reached a point where his helmet is awash. His air and phones have been checked on the surface. But this final check is most important, since it's the first to be made underwater. First, he closes the spit cut. Next, the air supply. The diver's rule is more air to me less air away, more air to me, less air away. Here he makes a final check of his diving gear. If anything feels loose or uncomfortable, now is the time to return to the surface and correct it. Before going over the side, the diver has regulated his exhaust valve. If he has any doubt about the setting, he checks it again. He closes it all the way then opens it two and one half turns. And the final check on the phone system. Red Diver, Topside, how do you hear me? Topside, this is Red Diver. I hear you loud and clear. How me? The diver's route to the bottom is the descending line usually rigged to the side of the diving barge and weighted on the bottom. On some jobs, however, the descending line is rigged some distance away from the diving barge. In this case, 
the diver will have to swim on the surface. To achieve the right degree of positive buoyancy for swimming, he first closes his exhaust valve, then regulates his air supply for just enough buoyancy to keep his faceplate out of the water. The swimming position in the heavy and cumbersome diving outfit is more like the position for treading water, and the swimming stroke is restricted to a kind of dog paddle. Sometimes the descending line is rigged to the barge, but some distance removed from the stage. In this case, the tender tows the diver on the surface, hauling on his lines to move him from the stage to the descending line. Usually, the descending line is rigged alongside the stage. The diver transfers to the line by simply reaching out and grasping it. In preparation for descending to the bottom, he adjusts his air supply for a small amount of negative buoyancy, a feeling of slight heaviness. The seasoned diver pays a great deal of attention to regulating his air supply and air exhaust. He knows that an imbalance of pressures can cause trouble. Improper valve settings have allowed too much air pressure to build up inside the suit. The suit overinflates. Before the diver realizes what's happening, the soft fabric becomes rigid with air pressure. The sleeves straighten out, trapping the diver's arms, making it impossible for him to reach his air valves. Helpless, he bobs to the surface like a cork. As he rises, the imbalance of pressure becomes greater. His diving dress may burst open, the sudden inrush of water causing the diver to sink and drown. Even with the lucky circumstance of the dress remaining intact, the results of a blow-up can be painful and crippling. Under inflation results in a different kind of trouble. The imbalance of pressures puts a squeeze on the diver's body. He has difficulty in breathing, pains in his sinus cavities, and bleeding from the nose and ears. In extreme cases, the squeeze tries to force the diver's body up into his helmet. Imbalance of pressure can be a killer. This diver seems to have his valves correctly regulated for a balance of pressures and a comfortable working buoyancy. But he's in trouble. Breathing is difficult. He is perspiring heavily and he feels headachy. The reason is this. The volume of air passing through his helmet is too small, permitting a buildup of carbon dioxide. The diver is starving for oxygen. The remedy is simple. The diver ventilates by depressing his chin button and opening his air control valve. After half a minute, he readjusts his valves to maintain buoyancy and pressure balance, but with increased volume to supply more air for breathing. Bearing these things in mind, the diver regulates his air with a great deal of care. When he is satisfied that he has an ample volume of air and slight negative buoyancy, he's ready to descend. He wraps his right arm around the descending line keeps his left hand on the air control valve and gives his tender the signal to descend, two pulls on the lines. The tender acknowledges the signal by repeating it and begins lowering the diver to the bottom. In a current to get a firmer grip, the diver wraps his legs around the descending line. Speed of descent is critical to the diver's well-being. The temptation is to go down quickly so as to have more working time on the bottom. But this is dangerous. The diver's body must adjust to the increasing pressure, and it adjusts slowly. The maximum speed of descent under any conditions is 75 feet per minute. Descending speed is regulated on the surface by the diving officer or diver in charge. The diver can go no faster than his lines are paid out but he can, by his grasp on the descending line, slow his rate of descent if he wishes. As the diver descends, the water pressure becomes greater. 
To compensate for the increasing pressure, the diver continuously adjusts his air supply to admit more air into his helmet. As he goes down, the diver equalizes the pressure on his ears by swallowing, yawning, or by pressing his nose against the face plate and forcibly exhaling through his blocked nostrils. If he experiences any difficulty in equalizing, he stops his descent briefly and tries again. Having the tender pull him up three or four feet may overcome the difficulty. If it does not, or if he has persistent pain in the ears or sinuses, the diver should inform topside and prepare to return to the surface. As the diver descends, he may find reasons to slow down his descent. If visibility is poor, he might collide with something. In a strong current, he must be especially careful. He keeps his back to the current and checks any tendency to swing by pushing the descending line to one side or the other. At all times during the descent, the diver proceeds cautiously, watching the tend of his lines to avoid entanglement with the descending line. If, in spite of his caution, the diver reaches the bottom to find his lines are wound around the descending line, he circles in the opposite direction to get them clear. The diver's first 30 seconds on the bottom may be the most important, in spite of the fact that he stays right where he is. He uses this half minute first to allow his body to adjust to the pressure at the bottom, and second, to completely ventilate his dress. He ventilates by fully depressing the exhaust valve chin button. This opens the exhaust valve all the way. Simultaneously, he opens his air control valve wider. The increased flow of air through the dress will refresh his air supply, give him plenty of oxygen during the 30 second adjustment period. When the 30-second ventilation period is completed, he must once again adjust his air supply for a good working buoyancy. He should feel slightly heavy with the weight of the breastplate and helmet just barely lifted from his shoulders. Now the diver is ready to begin work, but first he takes a good look around to check his bearings. He notes the direction of the light entering the water, bottom characteristics, any landmarks that might be present and the direction of the current. The diver always thinks ahead to conserve strength and avoid trouble. His working pace is unhurried, deliberate. He avoids the nervous outpouring of energy, the frantic effort that can lead to dangerous mistakes. When traveling on the bottom, the diver carries one turn of his lines over his right arm. This is to avoid being thrown off balance by a signal pull from the tender. At all times, the diver is conscious of his lines. To avoid their becoming fouled, he passes over obstructions, never under them. Even the most experienced diver will get into a tight spot once in a while. Instead of pushing the panic button, the diver pauses, sizes up the situation, calmly figures out the best solution, and then does something about it always keeping topside informed. He remembers that he is not alone. His tenders are standing by to help him. They are watching his progress constantly and are always alert for signs of trouble. The diver immediately reports topside any difficulties to the surface. Red diver topside, say again. Red Diver topside, say again. If phone communication is lost, the tender falls back on his basic means of communication, line pull signals. One pull, are you all right? The diver answers with three pulls repeated three times, which means I am fouled, but can clear myself. The tender acknowledges the signal by repeating it.
And so, working calmly and deliberately, the diver corrects the difficulty and goes about his business. One of the diver's most valuable tools is his degree of buoyancy. With normal buoyancy, just slightly negative, pulling on a line can be difficult. So the diver makes himself heavier by depressing his chin button and thus opening wide his exhaust valve. Now, the weight of his diving outfit gives him purchase, enabling him to do the job. For lifting heavy objects, the diver wants to be lighter to let increased buoyancy do the work. He grasps the chin button with his lips and pulls it toward him, closing the exhaust valve. In effect, he makes a balloon of his diving outfit, lets positive buoyancy do the lifting. Often the diver will need to work on his side, lying down on the bottom. Again, he changes buoyancy, making himself heavier. Since this will likely be a prolonged working period, he opens his exhaust valve wider rather than using his chin button. And he increases his air supply. The greater volume of air passing through his dress will prevent mud or sand working back to clog his exhaust valve. The diver sometimes finds his lines are fouled, but he keeps his head and refuses to panic. He retraces his steps, finds the trouble, corrects it, and goes on to finish the job. It's just another minor problem. Major problems have an answer too. One such problem is a badly fouled air hose. It cannot be cleared and has to be replaced. The standby diver immediately descends with the replacement. The foul diver has sufficient air in his helmet to last through the exchange. As long as both divers remain calm and follow the proper procedure, a major problem can be corrected with a minimum of danger. But ordinarily, the diver's work is routine. He works matter-of-factly at a deliberate speed that gets the job done safely. One of his good working habits is this. Periodically, he stops to think things over, making sure that he is in control of the situation. Concentration and exertion can result in a need for more air. And so he ventilates for a half minute and readjusts his air supply. Red diver, clear yourself. Stand by to come up. His work is done and the diver prepares to surface. The diver clears himself, he gives three pulls, take up my excess slack. As he returns to his descending line, he retraces his steps to avoid looping his lines around obstructions. His pace is still deliberate, his attitude cautious. Although his work on the bottom is finished, his job is not done for an important part of the working dive, the ascent to the surface remains ahead. The diver's ascent is not merely a return to the surface, for ever since he left the surface, the diver has been breathing compressed air. Oxygen and nitrogen going into his lungs pass into his bloodstream and then into his body tissues. His body uses the oxygen but the nitrogen remains and accumulates. The process reverses as the diver ascends. Nitrogen passes back into the bloodstream and returns to the lungs and is exhaled by the diver. But the body geared to operate at surface pressure does not handle nitrogen efficiently. Gradually during the working dive, the nitrogen accumulation builds up and as the tissues absorb nitrogen slowly, so do they release it slowly. If the diver's ascent is hurried, the pressure on his body decreases too rapidly, and this happens. Nitrogen particles force their way out of the tissues, causing small ruptures. The particles gather into large bubbles, and these bubbles are the diver's greatest enemy. For an illustration of their force, Try shaking a warm bottle of ginger ale, then opening it. 
the bubbles gather in the joints of the body, causing more ruptures, pressing against nerves. This is the diver's disease, the painful bends. In extreme cases, a large nitrogen bubble lodges in the brain, an artery, or the heart. The result can be death. The diver knows that his ascent to the surface is governed by the amount of nitrogen absorbed by his body during his dive. He knows that his ascent must be slow to allow the nitrogen to pass off harmlessly. He prepares for this slow ascent by first checking the tend of his lines, making sure they are free of all obstructions. He regulates his air supply for slightly negative buoyancy to help the tender, whose job it is, to manually lift the diver to the surface. Four pulls on the line, haul me up. Acknowledgement by the tender. And the diver is on his way to the surface. Ascent is time, maximum speed, 60 feet per minute, one foot per second. Top side, red diver, leaving the bottom. Top side eye. As he rises, the diver maintains a loose grip on the descending line and regulates his air supply to maintain a slightly negative buoyancy. He continues to rise, but not for long, for in a minute or two, it is time for his first decompression stop where he will pause to let the nitrogen pass out of his system. The depths of decompression stops and the length of time the diver must pause at each one are listed in the standard air decompression tables. If nitrogen bubbles are the diver's worst enemy, these tables are his best friend. They are the result of years of work, endless calculation, and countless test dives to prove them. The tables contain all the information for bringing a diver to the surface safely. Working depth, bottom time, which is the total time from leaving the surface to leaving the bottom, time needed to get to the first stop, traveling at 60 feet per minute, depth of decompression stops, total ascent time, and a key letter for referring to another chart if the diver is to make another dive within 12 hours. The use of the tables is simple. A diver is working at a depth of 100 feet. He spends 120 minutes in getting to the bottom and doing his job. It takes his tender one minute and 10 seconds to haul him up to the first decompression stop, a depth of 30 feet, where he pauses for 12 minutes. His second stop is at 20 feet, or another pause of 41 minutes. Then at 10 feet below the surface, he spends another 78 minutes for a total ascent time of slightly over 132 minutes. Two hours to get to the bottom and do his job. Two hours and 12 minutes to return to the surface. During the decompression stops, the diver clings to his descending line and relaxes. Finally, the ascent time is over, and the diver is brought aboard. The tenders stay close to the diver, tending his lines carefully as he crosses the deck. Only when the diver is safely seated on the dressing stool do the tenders unbutton his faceplate and remove his helmet. Often, divers are decompressed on the surface in compressed air tanks called recompression chambers. These are used when the water is extremely cold or rough, when the diver is injured or dangerously fatigued, when other emergencies arise, or if surface decompression adds to the efficiency of the diving operation. For surface decompression, the diver is brought to the surface more quickly with fewer and shorter stops. he must be put into the chamber quickly within five minutes of leaving his last decompression stop. 
he stops on deck only long enough to be undressed. A tender always accompanies the diver inside the chamber and stays with him during the entire decompression period. Decompression in the chamber follows the same procedures as for underwater decompression, specified amounts of pressure for a specified length of time. Pressures and times are again found in the standard decompression tables under the heading surface decompression, using air or using oxygen, depending upon which method will be used. Surface decompression offers the following advantages. It's more reliable than decompression in cold water. The diver can be kept under observation or treated for injury. And it allows the ship to get underway sooner in case of tight schedules or rough weather. The working dive is finished, but the diver may have one more responsibility, still another safety precaution. If he has been working in deep water, he will remain aboard in the immediate vicinity of recompression facilities for at least an hour, or following work at extreme depths for a period of 12 hours. Chances are he'll have no trouble, but if the bends should strike, he will need help quickly, and the only help is further recompression. The deep sea diver's job is demanding and disciplined, but the rules are simple, sane, common sense procedures. For his protection, his benefit, and in the interest of his efficiency, as well as that of the Navy, he follows the rules because it makes good sense.